All right. Good afternoon. Before we start, a few um, bits of administration, a few reminders. Uh, first of all, so most of you, or well, all of you should now have picked your project topic and placed it in a little uh, discussion on your discussion board. Um, and you know, your project's now gonna go, you're gonna start working on your project and that's all gonna go fine and if it isn't, talk to the TA. But one thing I want to remind you of is that you have to split your uh, data, if you're working on a specific data set, you have to split it into a test set and a training set. And that training set you then split again into a validation and a training set. But the important thing is to do the, make that split now, before you start looking at the data. Because uh, once you've looked at the test set, once you've used the test set, you can't unsee it. You can't go back. Uh, so at the start of your project, right now, split off a test set, put it aside, save it for later. Don't look at your te test set until the end. So that's important. Uh, remember to do that now, because if you forget, then it's a sort of kind of a mistake that you can't undo. And second thing I want to tell you, just uh, to point out, look at the, have a quick look at the rubric. It's on Canvas. And it tells you what's important for this for the project, what we're going to look at to grade the project. So if you want an easy pass mark for the project, just do whatever the rubric says, and you'll be OK. And so it, it would be slightly pointless not to have a look at it and just do what it says, and then do whatever else you feel like doing. Um, so just remember to have a look at that right now. It's on Canvas. So today's topic is deep learning. Uh, second topic, the second uh, time we visit deep learning. Um, before we start with deep learning proper, uh, some of you are actually doing deep learning type stuff for the project, are actually investigating these kinds of convolutional neural networks or other kinds of neural networks for the project. So a few tips for those of you playing around with this, uh, even if you're not doing it uh, for the project. Uh, so deep learning requires a lot of computation. It's very intensive. Uh, and most of you are running these projects on your laptops or maybe on your desktops at home. But most of you don't have big machines with big GPUs available. Uh, so in that case, one trick to uh, sort of still do very powerful stuff is to use transfer learning. Uh, basically, big companies with big resources have trained very big networks like uh, Google and uh, Facebook. They train these big image classifier networks. And it turns out that if you take the first bunch of layers from this network, download it, you, they put it online for free, you download the whole network, you take the top of this, the bottom of this network, and you remove the last few layers, and then put your own stuff on top of that without retraining any of this big network from Google, uh, you get very powerful, you can build very powerful models. Because basically it turns out that all this stuff that Google gives you um, generalizes very well, works very, uh, transfers very well to other learning problems. So if you take, if you start with this big Google network that you can download and then stick your own layers on top of that and only train your own layers, don't train any of the Google layers, uh, you sort of get the best of both worlds because you're not training any of these starting layers, so it's not a very expensive network to train. But you still get all this, this benefit of all these uh, layers that Google trained on millions and millions of high resolution images. Uh, so that's called transfer learning, and you can very easily, in Keras, you can download one of these networks and stick it into your own model. Uh, so that's worth checking out. Another thing, oh, uh, question from above. Ah, so that's a good question. Uh, if you do this, does it only work on the objects on which it's been trained? Uh, so now that's what I meant by transferability. It, it transfers pretty well to other images as well. So you get very good generic image features that, can, uh, that are very good to use. Uh, another thing, if you're doing this deep learning, uh, something I didn't mention last time, the way we do this usually, the way we see whether something is going well, is by looking at our loss curve. So let's say we have to set something like the learning rate, and we don't know what the learning rate should be. Uh, we try a couple of learning rates, and for each learning rate we see the training loss for every batch in our training uh, regime, in our training uh, program, uh, we plot the loss, basically. And then we add a little smoothing, usually, to make it easier to see. 
and then you get these kinds of patterns. So if we set the learning rate here for to 0.05, then clearly the training loss is not going down, so we're not learning anything, so that's too high. And then as you can see for 0 0.01 and three zeros and a five, no, four zeros and a five, uh, sorry, let me say it properly. So uh, two zeros and one, we get a pretty decent slide down and then it hits this lowest point, uh, but not as quick as it goes for three zeros uh, followed by a five. So that's basically the best learning rate because it decays very quickly, the loss, and it ends up at this minimum over all these, these, loss, uh, these learning rates that we've tried. And then we see if we set the learning rate too small, so four zeros and a five, the light blue one, that it decays even slower and it actually gets stuck in this uh, uh, a worse minimum than the other ones get stuck in. Uh, so this kind of picture tells you a lot about your learning pr process. It tells you a lot about how well your neural network is doing and how it's sort of navigating this loss landscape. So if you're training neural networks or any other kind of deep model, these are very good pictures to draw and to uh, have a look at to sort of um, diagnose your model. So just two tips for people doing deep learning. Um, and today we are going to talk about deep learning uh, for generative modeling. So instead of doing classification, oh, I shouldn't touch the wires, sorry. So instead of doing classification or uh, regression or anything like that, what we're doing is uh, generative modeling. So we give our uh, model a data set and we ask our model to train a probabili probability distribution from which we can sample new things that look like they came from the data set. And if you'll give me f two minutes, I'm just checking whether any of the recording has failed because sometimes when I touch the wire, the recordings fail. Oh, it looks like everything's still moving. So, <coughs> generators. Uh, so, step one, we will talk about exactly how you would uh, build a neural network that instead of producing a classification or regression value can actually produce images or bits of language or something like that, which we'll call a generator. And then we'll look at one particular way of training generators, which is called a generative adversarial network. And then after the break, we will look at the other way of doing it, which is called an autoencoder. Which is a slightly ad hoc network and a slightly more beautiful and more principled approach is called a variational autoencoder. Variational autoencoder. And that's what we'll finish up with. But first, generators. So, um, oh yeah, generative models. So this is, you may remember this from the opening lecture, when I uh, briefly talked about generative models. This is probably the most impressive recent example from last year. These are people that don't exist. So these are people that were dreamed up by a neural network that only saw faces and was not given any kind of uh, information about what a face is or what a person is. So if you replace the data set of human faces by the data set of dog faces, it would learn to generate dog faces just as well. Uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about. So first, uh, generators, how do we turn a neural network into a sampling distribution? A little visual shorthand for the rest of the lecture. Uh, I will be talking about feed-forward neural networks, so neural networks that have some input and some output, and usually the output is something that looks like our data, so the output is the, like a picture. So the output is a big layer and the input is a small layer. I'll draw them like this. Two layers and then a little sort of uh, triangle thing in between. And what I mean by this is any kind of feed-forward networks. Could be anything in between these two layers. Could be a hundred convolutions, could be upsampling layers, could be anything could be fully connected layers. For now, we don't care. It's just a neural network, and 
let's assume they are very big neural networks, but otherwise we're not, uh, we're not making any assumptions. And then we'll often be sampling from a standard multivariate normal distribution, which you should by now be familiar with after la last week's lecture. So I will draw those, uh, use this little uh, dotted circle as a sort of schematic representation of a multivariate normal distribution. And if it's a standard multivariate normal, then it will be a circle centered on the origin. That's what this represents. So that will be our sort of visual language for the rest of the lecture. So now the question is, how do we turn a neural network into a sampling distribution? Because a neural network is just a deterministic function. You give it some input, and you get some output. And if you do that again, you get the same output again. It's deterministic. The same input will always lead to the same output. Uh, so we need to somehow extend it with something to, in order to make it into a probability distribution, into something stochastic, that if we run it again, we get a different answer. So there's two ways of doing this, or two obvious ways. The first is to give it some input and to make it output the parameters of a probability distribution. So we feed it some input, we don't care what's uh, at the moment, and whatever comes out we interpret as the mean and the sigma of a multivariate normal in this case. And then we can either sample from that multivariate normal or we can compute the likelihood of a particular point under that multivariate normal. Uh, and this is uh, sometimes very useful to do this. It helps you, for instance, to create a neural network that can communicate that it's uncertain about its answer or how certain it is about its answer. So if it's very sure about its answer, then the sigma will be very small, very close. Uh, the, all the probability mass will be very close to mu and mu will basically be its answer. And if it's not really certain, then it can really blow up sigma and say, I don't really know, it's somewhere, somewhere over there. Uh, but the shape of the probability distribution that you get out of this network once you fed it the input is not very interesting. Well, I mean, it's a multivariate normal distribution, so as interesting as multivariate normal, but it's never going to be have uh, any more interesting shape than this kind of hyper ellipse that the uh, multivariate normal draws. If we want to use the power of neural networks to really reshape this circular, circular distribution into something more interesting, we have to do it the other way around. So that's option two. We sample an input from a random, uh, from a multivariate normal distribution, a standard one in this case. We feed it through some neural network, and then we observe the output. So if we look at this whole thing put together, that's a process that's uh, a stochastic process. It's something that gives us a random outcome, right? We sample a random input and we feed it through a deterministic function. We get some random output. Uh, so let's see with a little experiment how complicated the shape of this, uh, this distribution can get. So here's a little experiment I tried. I built just a very s simple 12 layer neural network, just 12 fully connected layers, each with 100 output, uh, 100 hidden nodes, all ReLU activated. And it's got two input nodes, the input layer has two nodes, and then after those 12 big fully connected layers, it gets projected back to two nodes. So this is just a probability distribution uh, in 2D, probability distribution on 2D space. So we sample uh, 100,000 points or something like that and plot them, and the shape of that uh, looks like this. Oh yeah, and we do this without learning. So we just initialize this network randomly and then have a look at what the distribution look like, looks like. So it looks like this. So this is not normally distributed. This is a very hi a highly complex, highly interesting looking uh, distribution. So that shows us that if we do it this way, we can transform a multivariate normal distribution into something very complicated and very interesting. And that's sort of the first step in allowing us to, to model all these highly complex distributions like human faces. Uh, you can do this, like I said, this uh, picture I drew stands for any kind of neural network. So you can also make the output a picture, like here. So we take a fully connected layer, we take something called an upsampling layer, which takes a picture and increases its resolution. Uh, we add some convolutions and we sort of keep alternating these convolutions and upsampling things. And then if we sample from this network without training it, just from the random weights, we get these kinds of pictures. 
these are 30 samples from this distribution that we've drawn here on the right, uh, on the left. And of course, option three is to do both. We can also feed it, feed the neural network a random input and make it output a multivariate normal distribution. So how now do we train these things? How do we, given that we have this kind of neural network, how do we make sure that the weights that the neural network has, uh, how do we fit the probability distribution that this whole thing represents to a particular data set? Uh, let's look at a naive approach first to see how it fails, because it's instructive to see how this goes wrong. So let's say we just think, well, why don't we just use backpropagation in a very standard way? So we generate some random output from our network, call that Y. We sample some random instance from our data set, call that X. And we compute the distance between those two because it's supposed to produce things that are like our data, right? So we just compute the distance between those two, call that the loss, and backpropagate. And that distance could be something like a mean squared error for every channel of every pixel or the binary cross entropy because all values are between zero and one. Uh, so we can also use binary cross entropy, L1 distance, anything like that. It doesn't usually matter very much. Just back prop just compute how far apart these two images are, the generated image and the data image, and backpropagate that loss. And uh, that doesn't work. And the way it doesn't work, the way it goes wrong, is called uh, mode collapse. I'll show you, try and show you sort of in a diagram why, uh, why that happens. So let's say these, uh, this 2D plane is our, uh, our instance space, and these are instances in our data or regions where the probability is high. And let's say we just randomly generate some, uh, some point from our model. So we randomly generate the green point, and it, does, it actually does pretty well. By, by chance, it does pretty well. It's quite near to one of the points in our data set. And then we randomly pick a point in our data set to compare it to. That might be this one. So even though it's doing pretty well, it's actually getting a huge loss because we've randomly picked some other point to compute the loss over. And it's being drawn towards this point. And what you get is uh, a model that instead of outputting lots of different things every time you, you sample a point from it, it basically always outputs this point, which is sort of right in the middle, the, the mean point of our data set because that's sort of minimizing the expected distance to all of the points in the data, and that's how it chooses to minimize its error. So instead of getting huge samples of faces of, of huge variety of men and women, people with glasses, without glasses, people with beards, without beards, you just get this face every single time, which is not what we want. So that's called mode collapse. Our data set has all these modes, the blue points, the areas of high probability, and instead of getting a distribution with lots of different modes, we get a distribution with one mode, the mean. So all the modes collapse to one mode. So that doesn't work. So what does work? Well, we'll look at two examples, the GAN and the autoencoders. So let's start with the GAN, the generative adversarial networks. Uh, and to explain the GAN, uh, we need to go back a little bit in history to the uh, sort of the time when this, um, these convolutional neural networks that we talked about. Uh, so we talked about these convolutional neural networks these last, uh, the last deep learning lecture, right? These big neural networks with lots of convolutions lay co convolution layers that are very good at image classification. Uh, so good, in fact, that they're at human level, or better than human level in some cases. They can recognize objects and images better than humans can. And people got very excited about this, obviously, in sort of around 2010, or, well, 2014, I guess this was. So excited that they started thinking, well, maybe these models are basically doing the same thing we are. Have we sort of copied humans' vision in silicon? Have we solved the problem of human vision? Um, and then people started looking around and started 
prodding around in these models, started figuring out what they could do, what they could do and how they responded to certain things. And one of the things they did was to um, pick a certain output neuron, so like the output neuron that corresponds to the bus class, and then to optimize, instead of optimizing the weights, optimize the input to maximize the class bus. So you're looking for an image using gradient descent that gives you the best chance of seeing the class bus. And what emerged was not a picture of a bus, but a picture that looked to us like random noise. And then uh, what, what they decided to do was to do the same thing, but instead of starting with, random, with a random point in the space of images, start with another picture. So here, top right in the ostrich column, what they did is they started with a picture of a bus. And then from there, they used gradient descent to optimize it to, uh, to maximally activate the class ostrich so that they would get something that looks to us well, like a bus, or that is as close as possible to the bus image, but to the network looks uh, uncannily like an ostrich. And it turns out that you don't have to move very far. In fact, you have to move so little that the picture to us still looks like a bus. So you get what's called this minimal distortion. You add a tiny little bit of noise to the bus image, and then the network is suddenly convinced, like 99% convinced, that this is an ostrich. So everything here on the right to your neural network looks like an ostrich. That's called an adversarial example, because you're producing these fake images that fool your network into thinking it's looking at something that to us looks like something completely different. So that was a bit of a blow to these neural network, um, to the neural network community and to people doing uh, computer vision, because these massively impressive convolutional networks didn't work quite as well as we thought they did. And certainly, they weren't quite as robust as we thought they were. But luckily, this allowed us quite quickly to come up uh, with a solution and with a way to actually make these neural networks stronger. Because it, uh, well, if you can generate these images automatically, and we could, then you can also add them to your data set as fake images. You can also then tell your neural network, look, these are fake. These are not ostriches. So that led to this kind of uh, ad hoc learning algorithm, where you basically, so we're doing binary classification now. Think of it as there's one positive class, let's say buses, and a negative class, everything else. So we train a classifier to tell uh, positive from negative. Then we generate some adversarial examples for that classifier. So these are ad examples, at least at first, that are clearly not in the positive class. They're clearly not buses, but to the classifier, they look exactly like buses. And then you add them to the data as negative examples. And then you go back to the beginning and you iterate this, so you train a, a better, more robust classifier that is hopefully now not tricked by these negative examples anymore. But then you generate, for this improved classifier, you generate more adversarial examples, better adversarial examples. So you're training a classifier, which we'll call a discriminator from now on, because it's discriminating between real and fake images. And you're training a generator, uh, which generates these fake images. And as the discriminator gets more robust, the generator gets more realistic. So after a while, you'll get a generator that's actually generating realistic picture, pictures of buses, and a discriminator that is not, no longer quite so uh, sensitive to adver adversarial attacks. So that was sort of the first way of doing GANs, which uh, worked and was sort of pretty impressive, but it's kind of ad hoc, because you have one generator that's sort of a weird search, search process where you're not, you're not generating in the way I showed you earlier, where you have a neural network that just generates stuff for you. You have to sort of search the space of images using gradient descent, so that's a bit messy. And it's not really end-to-end, -end, and you don't really know how many of each of these things you have to do. Probably you have to train your classifier quite, quite a long time before it converges. So there's a, a nicer way of, of doing this in a more sort of end-to-end -end way, uh, which is called, well, we'll call that the vanilla GAN, so the basic approach to GANs. And then I'd like to show you three other ways to build on top of that framework to uh, 
create some of these impressive examples. Most of the quite impressive examples that I showed you in the introduction lecture and in the deep learning lecture were actually GANs. So we'll go through that today. We'll show you how these uh, examples work. Um, but we'll start with this vanilla, these vanilla GANs. So how do we make this, this idea of the GAN a little bit uh, nicer and make it fit a little bit better in our existing frameworks? Uh, so we create two neural networks. On the left, we see the generator that we saw already. So it's this basic neural network into which goes a random, uh, multivariate random value and out of which pops something that the neural network has generated that we will hopefully train to become more like a bus. And then there's the discriminator, which is just a plain old image classifier with two classes, so a sigmoid activation at the top. And all it has to do is tell us which examples are fake and which examples are real. And the way we train it first, obviously we feed it our real examples that we have, the pictures of buses, and we give it the target positive, because these are real examples, so these are the examples that it should call positive. So now we have an output and a training example, so we have an error, so we can backpropagate. Uh, so we can train on the real examples. And then for the fake examples, we just take the generator, which at first is just a randomly wired neural network, so it's just producing random noise where we, like we saw earlier. We freeze its weights, we don't update the weights of the generator, and whatever it outputs we feed directly into the discriminator. So we stick them on top of each other so they become one neural network, and whatever comes out of this thing, the discriminator should classify as negative. Because whatever it produces is fake. Even it, if it, by chance it happens to produce a completely lifelike bus, it's still fake, so we still want to tell that's a negative uh, example. So again, here we have a target which we can backpropagate. So that's how we train the discriminator. And th at the first iteration, it's just discriminating pictures like this from pictures of white noise or uh, colored noise. But after we train the generator a few times to be more uh, realistic, uh, the task becomes more difficult. And we train the generator by taking this picture. So now we've trained the discriminator a little bit. We freeze the weights of the discriminator. And now we train the generator, weights of the generator, to produce things that this particular discriminator will classify as positive. So we switch around from here. We switch which parts of the uh, network we are training. And we switch what should come out of it at the top. And basically what you, do, you, what you usually do is just do one iteration for every step. So we do one iteration of this and then one iteration of that. And we switch back and forth. So we don't have to train either of them until they converge. We just keep flipping back and forth. And hopefully, the loss will sort of converge. And every time the generator does one update, it's uh, trying to beat the uh, discriminator from the last round. So what you can think of GANs as a kind of two-person game. Uh, two-person zero-sum game where the discriminator tries to catch out the generator, it tries to recognize the pictures that the generator thinks are false, uh, sorry, it tries to recognize the pictures that the generator generated, and the generator is trying to fool the discriminator. So it's a kind of arms race, and as one gets better, the other has to get better as well. So that's your basic vanilla GAN. So now let's, let's look at a couple of these other, uh, these ways to extend this principle. The first is the conditional GAN. So I showed you this picture earlier, of uh, just to show to show you something impressive that neural networks can do. Um, but let's look at this a little bit closer. So this was a, a basic task of image-to-image -image mapping. So let's look at the top right here, for instance, where we are colorizing images. So a black and white image goes out, goes in, color image comes out. And if you think about that, you actually have sort of the on the one hand, it's a neural network, so it just has a basic input and an output. But you also want some kind of stochasticity here. You want the neural network to make some random choices. So if you train this just on colored and black and white images, 
and it sees lots of butterflies, it sees a red butterfly and a yellow butterfly and a green butterfly, what you get out is only gray butterflies because the neural network has no stochasticity, it has no randomness, so it can't sort of choose. Uh, so it's sort of just, yeah, you get this, basically this mode collapse again. You get an average colored butterfly instead of having the neural network actually pick a color. So what you want is sort of to combine these two uh, ways of doing things, and that's what the conditional GAN gives you. It's a function that takes an input, but then samples from the space of possible, uh, of the space of correct outputs. So it samples the color yellow for this particular butterfly. Uh, that's really what we want in these cases. Uh, so now our generator, instead of just generating a particular picture from uh, multivariate normal noise, it actually gets an input plus some noise from somewhere that's not drawn in this case. It gets an input and it has to sample an output. And the way we wire this up, it's pretty simple. Basically, we use this generator to take this uh, line drawing of a shoe. We use it to map it to a genuine shoe or to a colored in shoe. And then we, from both of them, we create a pair of images. And the pair of images is fed to the discriminator. And the job of the discriminator is to determine whether or not this is a real pair of images, because our data set contains lots of pairs of, of images on the right, uh, as, as shown on the right, or this is a fake pair of images as created by the generator. So again, we have this big end-to-end -end network here on the left, which we can train to generate fake as a label. And on the right, we just feed it pairs of images from the data set and train it to generate the label, pos uh, the label real or pause. So that's your basic conditional GAN. Uh, but sometimes you don't have paired images. To, to make this work, you need pairs of images. You need this particular line drawing maps to this particular boot, or this particular color images image maps to this desaturated image, this non-colored image. Uh, so for all of these tasks that I showed you earlier, you can do this. There is data available. But for some tasks, there isn't. For instance, uh, mapping horses to zebras. If you start with a picture of a horse, a human artist could show you how that would look like if it were a picture of a zebra. But we don't have lots of pairs of this particular horse would look like this if it were a zebra. We have a lot of pictures of horses and we have a lot of pictures of zebras, but they're not paired. So that's a different case and you can also do this for, uh, for instance, uh, photographs. We have a lot of photographs of scenes that, it, uh, that uh, somebody like Monet would have uh, might have painted, and we have a lot of paintings by Monet, but we don't have any photographs together with paintings that show us what they would have looked like if Monet had painted them, or the other way around. And you can make this, but it's very, very expensive. You could hire an artist to make these pictures, but it would be expensive. So instead, we just uh, figure out a way to make a GAN that works on two unpaired bags of images, and one GAN that does that very successfully is called the cycle GAN. And the main idea of the cycle GAN uh, is first of all to have two generators, one from the domain, so one from horses to zebras, and one from zebras to horses. So for every, every pair of domains, we do, it, uh, we do this uh, problem both ways. Uh, we learn to map the mapping both ways. And then we add a constraint in uh, terms of a loss term. So we have this loss term already based on this uh, uh, conditional GAN we tried earlier. But to this loss term, we add one other constraint, which is called the cycle consistency loss term, which says that if we map a horse to a zebra and then back to a horse, we should get the original horse back. So whatever information there is about the horse encoded in the horse image, should also be encoded sufficiently in the zebra image to get the original horse image back. And we do that just by mapping back and forth and s looking at the distance between the original horse image and the uh, horse image that we got from mapping to zebra and back. Uh, and the uh, bigger that distance is, oh, sorry, the bigger that distance is, 
the um, bigger our loss. So you can think of this as uh, the generators moving back and forth are practicing a kind of steganography. If you don't know what steganography is, it's basically hiding a, a code, a coded message in plain sight. So you send a message, let's say you're uh, stuck behind enemy lines, you're an enemy agent stuck behind enemy lines and you want to send a message to your handler. You disguise it as a message to your mother, saying everything is well and here's a nice recipe for uh, cookies or something. But then inside the recipe, you hide the secret message to your, uh, to your handler. That's steganography. And that's basically what these um, generators are doing. They are hiding the horse image inside the zebra, but in such a way that the discriminator cannot tell that there is a zebra hidden inside this horse. Because that's what the discriminator is looking for. The discriminator is looking for fake messages, uh, so sort of fake uh, photographs. And in the real photographs, there is not a horse hi hidden in the zebra. So that's one way to think of this. Uh, and here's some nice images of photographic inputs that look like they were uh, that are transformed to Monet paintings and the other way around. And click the links for more uh, nice images. It doesn't always work. Uh, I was looking at this and I was thinking, it's sort of there's sort of some reason by why behind why this didn't work, because of course in the data set there is never a picture of a, a human riding a zebra. So if you have to hide this image on the left inside a zebra image, and you keep Mr. Putin looking like Mr. Putin, the discriminator is going to know that that's not a zebra because it's unlikely that Mr. Putin ever rode a zebra. Um, so ultimately, this other solution is what it came up with. It's probably better, probably more likely, although still not that likely, to fool the discriminator. Uh, so anyway, that's the, uh, the cycle GAN, mapping un unpaired images from one to another. It works, it doesn't always work, but in some cases, like horses and zebras or like paintings and styles, it works. And then finally, I thought I'd, I thought I'd talk about the uh, style GAN, which is uh, last year's image, uh, last year's uh, GAN that gave us this, uh, these uh, hyper-realistic photographs of people, just because I've been sort of using this as an example so much, I thought I'd better give you the basic idea of how these, how these things work. Um, and there's a lot of, I, I read the paper, there's a lot of um, different things they did. There's a lot of stuff they, they tried, a lot of tricks, big bag of tricks that you have to do to, to get this to work properly. Um, but I think distilling it mainly, this is sort of the basic, uh, the most important part. This is the most, this is sort of, probably this is the key idea of the uh, model, so you have to do this and then lots of other stuff to make it work. But I think this is the main idea that they used. Um, so on the left, you see here the, uh, the latent vector that we are, uh, we've so far been using. You uh, sample a latent vector. Yeah, I, uh, I don't think I've used that word before, so we call that the latent vector, this uh, vector that you sample from the multivariate normal distribution that goes into the network. But instead of feeding it sort of into the network once at the bottom, uh, what they do is they use this insight that a uh, convolutional neural network that is used to generate images, so it's actually a deconvolutional neural network, um, it sort of generates images from low level uh, semantic properties to high level semantic properties. So first it starts by sort of as, uh, as you would if you decided to draw an image, it starts by deciding things like gender and hair color and uh, ethnicity and maybe lighting direction and where the person is looking. And then it slowly fills in more details like the shape of the eyes, the shape of the nose, the uh, condition of the skin, maybe the age. And then it looks at very fine-grained details like this particular patch of skin, does it have a mole on it? In this part of the hairstyle, what direction do the hairs move? So from the bottom to the top, you sort of work in the details slowly. And what the style GAN does, it calls these styles, it gives the latent vector at each level of detail. Uh, and it passes it through a, a basic a fine uh, transformation, which I've uh, drawn like a little box here. So at everything, it, it's passed through this affine, uh, affine uh, 
transformation to map it to the right size, because it needs to be the size of the image once we're sort of halfway through this transformation. Uh, but we feed it again and again to the network. So at every, it's like an, the network is like an artist, and at every point in this, uh, this stage of, fill, of this process of filling in the details, it can sort of refer back to, oh, what, what was I thinking? What was I going to make this person? Uh, what had I decided about their details? And then in addition to that, we feed it random noise per layer. Because if you're an artist and you're drawing a face, at every step of the way, you need to sort of make random decisions, first of all. Uh, and then you get some random noise from the latent vector. But you also need to, the more details you fill in, the more details you need to decide on. Like every single hair, you need to decide in exactly which direction it's going. Every little single bit of skin, you need to decide is there going to be a mole or a scar there. Uh, so in order to take sort of some of the weight off the latent vector of all these decisions, because if you don't feed it any noise, then all of the randomness has to come out of the latent vector. So in order to take some of the weight off it, we feed it some extra noise from outside which doesn't have to be sort of uh, connected to each other, uh, so that less of that information has to come from the latent vector. And this allows us we can um, take this model and have a look at, at what happens if we change things around. So let's say we've trained this as a GAN. And now, after training, what we do is, instead of feeding it the same latent vector at all stages of the process, we start with one latent vector, red latent vector, and then either at the beginning, the middle, or the end, we feed it some bits of another latent vector. So just at some parts of the process, we switch out the latent vector to something else. And this was actually uh, done during training as well. So uh, they did this occasionally during training to force the network to be able to adapt with this. So that if you do this, you do generate images that fool the discriminator. Uh, so here's what happens if you do that for the, if you insert the blue bits at the bottom. This is the source. Uh, oh no, sorry. So this is, uh, I always mix up what's the source and the destination in these ones. Uh, yeah, I think the colors are wrong. I'll check that uh, after the lecture. But if we do this for the lower layers, we get these results. So this is a, these people here are now mapped, uh, are sort of the, all, all, of, uh, all of these faces are, are generated faces. And during their generation, we take some of the styles of these people uh, on the left, and we mix them into the generation process. And if we do that at the beginning, we see here that the low level choices of this picture are sort of uh, ethnicity, hair color, not necessarily gender, because for one of them, uh, oh no, not necessarily, not here. Uh, I thought gender was flipped, but I think for most of it's consistent. Boy, is Boy might be flipped. Uh, well, yeah, it's difficult to tell with young children. But uh, you can see that, for instance, the beard is not necessarily, uh, whether this person has a beard is not decided at this, uh, or is decided at this level that we've manipulated, because this sort of person suddenly have, certainly suddenly has a beard. Then if we go to the middle layers, we see we, that we uh, retain a little, that the, the um, images, we, the styles that we take over from these uh, people here are slightly different. So a little bit more of the ethnicity is uh, maintained. And then for the final row, you see that only real surface details are uh, uh, inserted or maintained. Uh, oh, I'm running a little behind, sorry. Uh, and we can do that with the other side of the model as well. So here's what happens if you take this noise and you keep all of the noise vectors the same. So you just keep those the same, except for the noise at the very last layer. And what you see is that you get this exactly the same picture, except very high-level surface details are slightly different. So it makes slightly different. The hairstyle is the same, the guy is the same, everything is the same, except it makes slightly different decisions about the orientation of each hair and exactly. Uh, so his hair is equally messy in each picture, but exactly in which way it's messy 
is slightly different. So it's quite a, a neat model that really, it doesn't just give you hyper-realistic faces, but it also allows you this kind of control over different levels of the output and then styles at different levels of the, uh, of the model. So those are the GANs. Just one more topic before we go to the break. Uh, which is what can we sort of do once we have this generator? Obviously, we can do generative modeling. We can sample stuff. Uh, but there's a couple of more things we can do. The bottom two only work for autoencoders, but the second one, interpolation, also works for GAN generators. Which is basically, if we have this, uh, this space, this multivariate distribution from which we pluck our inputs, what we can do is take two points from that space and draw a line between those two points and pick equally spaced points on that line. And we can take those equally po spaced points and feed them through the generator. And what we see is, hopefully, if it works well, if this latent space is n laid out neatly, we will see a gradual transformation from one output to the next. It's called interpolation, and it gives you a really good view of whether your generator works well, whether it has a nice latent space. If this transformation is A, smooth, so there's no big sudden changes. And B, everything in between these point, two points also looks realistic. And you can also do this with a grid of points. So you just make a grid of equally spaced points and you map the corners to four points in, four arbitrary points in your latent space. You feed everything through the generator and you get a, an interpolation grid, which gives you a little bit more to work with. Um, and just a technical note, because these latent spaces are laid out usually in sort of spherical um, topologies, basically if you, ha if you have a, a multivariate normal distribution that is very high dimensional, uh, you don't get what you get in small dimensions where you get lots of, sp uh, lots of points clustering near the origin. Uh, that only happens in low dimensions. If you get a high dimensionality, you get something much more like a soap bubble or a hypersphere where everything clusters near this spherical region, uh, which means that if you want to do interpolation, you also need to uh, ideally move through this spherical region because that's where all the probability mass is, so that's where all the examples are that the training process is seen. So to do that, you can do something called spherical interpolation, which means that if you have two points in your latent space, you don't draw a line between them, but you draw an arc between them. And then you pick points evenly spaced on the arc and decode those. Just a little technical point if you want to try this yourself. And then we'll go into the break with these two things. So if you want to do data manipulation, if you want to take a point from your data, map it to the latent space, manipulate it, and map it back, or if you want to do uh, dimensionality reduction, so you want to map into the latent space and use that latent representation to uh, do machine learning on. For both of those things, you need to be able to map into the latent space. And so far, we've only uh, built generators that map from the latent space to our output. Uh, so that brings us neatly to autoencoders, which we'll talk about after the break. All right, uh, one more GAN slide that accidentally got uh, moved to the, uh, to the second half. Uh, just to um, uh, mitigate a little bit against the Dunning-Kruger Dunning effect so you don't think you now know everything there is to know about GANs. There's lots of, especially with GANs, there's lots of little tricks and lots of stuff you have to work out in order to make this work properly. They're very fickle models. So a couple of things I didn't talk about are on this slide, things like Wasserstein distance, uh, how to evaluate GANs. GANs are difficult to evaluate to show that they actually work better. Uh, batch normalization is something that's not specific to GANs, but I can never find a proper 
part to inject it into the course anywhere else. So if you, uh, so I, I skip it for the for the other lectures. But if you want to do GANs, it's very important to look up backpropagation. There's something called relativistic GANs, which is also good to know. So if you're interested in this and you want to actually do this, remember this slide and look uh, investigate these subjects as well. Uh, but for now, we're going to talk about autoencoders. Because, as I said in the break, if we want to do all these other things, if we want to do data manipulation, if we want to do, um, uh, what else did I say, dimensionality reduction, we need to not just map from this latent space, from this probabilistic space, to the output, but also from our data to the latent space, which uh, gives us this kind of network called an autoencoder. So we have some input, which is our data. And we get some output at the end of the network, which should look as much like the input as possible. It's called a bottleneck architecture. The only thing it has to learn is to reproduce the input, which sounds easy enough. But somewhere in the middle, we get a very small layer. And that layer is what we call the latent space in this model. So it has to pass the input through this small representation of a couple of uh, maybe a small, feature vec a small vector of like 128 nodes. And then from that, it has to decode the output. And that output has to look as much as possible like the input. So for instance, if we do this with images, uh, in this case, we uh, call the bottom network the encoder and the top network the decoder. And it might look something like this. So we get some output, which looks a little bit like the input, but not quite. We compare it to the input, and the difference becomes our loss. Uh, and then we train and train and train. And so let's imagine that our latent space is just two numbers. So it's just a two-node uh, two layer. Then we can actually plot these latent codes, latent representations, in a two-dimensional space. So if we find those points and then in that part of the space plot the input image, we get something like this. And hopefully, if our neural network works well, if it's done this job well, we get a kind of clustering where uh, people who smile, for instance, find a cluster uh, in one part of the space, and people who frown find a cluster in another part, another part of the space. And somewhere, we get outliers like this of people who hold their hand in front of their face or do other weird things. But hopefully, our, uh, this, this latent space is sort of laid out in, these, in terms of these high-level semantic features. Uh, yes, yeah, so I have some examples from a very simple, uh, very simple autoencoder, which is just uh, this based on this phases data set, uh, and just using a couple of fully connected layers to move to this latent space, and a couple of fully connected layers to move back with ReLU activation. So the results are not quite staggering, but it shows you sort of the idea, and it's something you could try on your laptop. Uh, so after five epochs, you get something like this. And then after 25, you start to see blurry faces. And then after 100 epochs, you get something that looks a little bit like the input. So the reconstructions are not perfect. Here's the data on the left and the reconstruction on the right. Note, for instance, that this woman here in the reconstruction has been given some sunglasses. Uh, so that's interesting because on the one hand, it's a mistake. But on the other hand, it's a sort of high-level semantic mistake. It's not like it gets some pixels wrong. It's just given somebody sunglasses that they didn't have at first. So that sort of also shows that the neural network is learning high-level uh, semantic features. Um, and with this, you can do more stuff than with just this uh, generator that we had earlier. For instance, you can do data manipulation. So if you want to make somebody smile, uh, so far it's an unsupervised method, right? We haven't had to annotate our data in any way. We just feed it a bag of data. Now we add a tiny little bit of annotation, tiny little bit of supervision. So we look through our data set and we select just 13 smiling people and 30 non-smiling people, where we try and find people who are properly frowning uh, or doing whatever the opposite of smiling is. And we encode these two sets into our latent space. So we get two bunches of points in the latent space, smiling and non-smiling. We find their means. So we just find the mean of all these points. 
and then we draw a vector between the two. And this, in our latent space, is the direction in which we want to move if we want to make somebody smile. So if we start here, we're a anywhere in the space, and we move in that direction, th and then decode the output, people will smile more. Move in the opposite direction, people will smile less. Uh, so here's a basic algorithm to make somebody smile. You encode the picture into the latent space. You get a vector called Z. Uh, and then you add a little bit of this smile vector, a small proportion of it. The more you add, the more they will smile. And the resulting point you decode to get a smiling face. And with my sort of crappy autoencoder, you get this. So it's not quite super convincing. Uh, but you sort of get the idea. So in the middle is the original, it's a reconstruction of the original pixel, I think, uh, picture, I think. Uh, and I think on the, on the left, entirely on the left, is the original picture. And to the right, they smile more and more. I was running some updated version of this experiment with some more, uh, uh, some uh, more uh, high resolution data and some colors and some a nicer autoencoder, but unfortunately it didn't quite finish so maybe next year, if you watch the slides for next year, you will maybe see an updated version of this. But I hope the idea is clear, that you can sort of manipulate stuff in your latent space and decode it to, uh, to do this kind of high-level manipulation of your data without having very much labeled data. So it's almost entirely unsupervised. You just have a handful of labeled examples for every, uh, every class that you're interested in, and you can still do this kind of stuff. Um, Oh, yeah, sure. Just, why is there always the same mix of this? Uh, <laughs> you said last time, but like dead neurons. Yeah, it's, yeah that's probably could be dead neurons. Um, there's a new version of the experiment where I use, uh, I don't, use uh, don't use fully connected layers. I use convolutions instead, and I don't get the missing pixels. So it's some effect of the, probably some effect of using fully connected layers together with a ReLU, which is, yeah, points to that, uh, the dead neurons that I talked about earlier. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, so that's data manipulation, but we were not talking about data manipulation, we were talking about generators. So once you have this autoencoder, once you have it trained up and works reasonably well, how do you turn it into a generator? Well, sort of ad hoc, but here's a, a Simple way of doing it. You train your autoencoder. You encode all your data to latent variables. So you get this cloud of points in your latent space. You fit a multivariate normal distribution to that. And then you sample points from that particular multivariate normal distribution. And you decode the sample. So if we say this blue cloud of points is our uh, 13,000 phases of the data set. We fit a multivariate normal to that, and we sample some red points from that multivariate normal. We feed that through the autoencoder, and we get phases like this. And again, not very good, but hopefully you get the idea. Um, so that sort of works all right. That's all I had to say about the autoencoder. It works all right, but um, it has some problems. Basically, you have to have this weird two-step thing where you have to first train your, th train your autoencoder and then fit a probability model to your data. Um, there's no guarantee that that model actually fits well. We're not telling the autoencoder to create a latent space that is laid out like a multivariate normal. Um, and it's all very ad hoc. I mean, what we ultimately want to do when we fit probability models, if you think back to last lecture, uh, last lecture it was all a lot more principled and it was all a lot more we have this maximum likelihood principle, and now we're going to maximize the probability of the likelihood of the probability of the data given the parameters. Uh, and now suddenly this lecture, because we're using neural networks, it's all very ad hoc, and we're suddenly creating two-person games or autoencoders. Uh, so we solve that in the last part of the lecture by turning to the variational autoencoder, which is a twist on the autoencoder. Um, I'll tell you first on a high intu uh, intuitive high level what it does. So it, it forces the decoder, first of all, to decode points 
near that are close to Z but not quite Z to also force uh, to decode those correctly. So it, uh, if you want to interpolate properly in your space, uh, this is very helpful because it sort of doesn't just focus on the points in your space that correspond to your data, but it also focuses on the points in between. We'll see how it does that later. And it forces the latent distribution of the uh, autoencoder of the, uh, this middle part. Uh, it sort of uh, ensures that when you map the data through the encoder, it takes the shape of a standard multivariate normal distribution. So it centers everything on the origin and gives everything variance, uncorrelated variance in every, of one in every direction. And most importantly, probably, it can be derived from first principles. So we will start with this maximum likelihood principle and unpack that and rewrite it, and it will turn into an out, uh, it will turn into an autoencoder. So we don't start with the assumption that we're building an autoencoder, just that we're doing maximum likelihood fit on this generator model that we saw earlier, and we will end up with an autoencoder. So here's our uh, model as a graphical model. Uh, basically, we're doing the same thing we did in the EM lecture, we have a hidden variable model, so we have some Z, which goes through some deterministic process, and out pops an X, and we observe only the Xs. And in the EM case, Z was which component we pick, and in this case, Z is our sample from a multivariate normal, standard multivariate normal, that we're going to feed into a neural network, like this. So the whole thing maps pretty well to this EM, or this, uh, this hidden variable model that we saw already in the EM lecture. Uh, and the parameters of our model, the things that we're going to fit to our data, are the parameters of our neural network, because that's the only thing we can change. So we start with the maximum likelihood objective. We want to change those parameters, the parameters of our model, which are the weights of our neural network, to maximize this value the logarithm of the probability density of the data given the parameters. So we had this uh, very useful decomposition that I showed you in the last uh, lecture with actually a slight mistake in this slide. Uh, I'll fix the slides later, but uh, I had to fix a slight mistake here at the bottom right. Um, but we'll go through the decomposition again for the neural network, so don't worry. But basically, we had this, um, this problem that we couldn't solve this maximum likelihood objective because there was this z factor that we couldn't marginalize out because that created a sum that was too big. And we couldn't solve, uh, solve this analytically as well, uh, analytically either, uh, because we didn't know which x mapped to which z. So we found out, we found that if we take any function q, which approximates z given x for us, we can decompose the probability of x given theta into these two ter terms, whatever q is, however bad of an approximation q is, this uh, decomposition always helps, uh, holds. And so that's what we're going to do with the neural networks as well. So we have our uh, bit in the middle. Uh, we have our generator, so a generator takes a sample from a multivariate normal distribution, maps it to an output through the neural network. And the problem is, my slides are slightly out of order. Um, yeah, let's just skip forward a bit. So the problem is this problem of mode collapse, that we don't know which Z corresponds no, sorry, I'm getting confused. This is not smart. Um, sorry. The problem is that we don't know which Z generated which X. So that was this problem of mode collapse, right? We, um, well, uh, sorry, I'm getting, I'm confusing myself. Let's take one step back. All right, so we have this decomposition for our hidden variable model. And the problem is that we don't have a mapping from observables from x to hidden variables, from x to z. We need a mapping from x to z. There's an optimal mapping pz given, given x, but we don't know it and we can't compute it. 
uh, and that's even more true now, because now we have this neural network. So if we wanted for a given x to work out what what z's, what inputs would be likely to produce this uh, this output, then we have to sort of invert the neural network. And this neural network is a very complex nonlinear function, so that's very difficult to do. So given an x, we can't figure out what input would have produced this x. I mean, we can do these kinds of gradient descent tricks and search for it, but it's very expensive. Um, so instead of doing that, what we're going to do is we're going to take another network, and it's going to approximate for us this inverse function. So we add this network at the bottom here, which maps from x to a distribution on z. So we assume that this inverse distribution is, uh, looks like a multivariate normal distribution. We just said the, the z vectors that are likely to produce x looks like a, uh, look like this multivariate normal on the latent space. So these are two neural networks, one to map from z to x and one to map from x to z. And we're going to train both of them together. So we'll call one of, one of them p and one of them q. And we'll call the parameters of p w and we'll call the parameters of q v. And those are the parameters of our model that we want to optimize. So if you think back to this mode collapse example, or we had this problem that if we generate some output, we sample some output from our model, from our generator, we don't know which point it belongs to. Now we don't have that problem because we can sample, uh, we can, uh, sorry, you can feed x into q. We get some distribution on the space z. We can sample a z from that, feed that into p, and get a distribution on x again. So if we do that, we sort of go to z and go back again, like an autoencoder. And then we know which point in the data belongs to the point we generated. So we can, even though it's closer to all these other points, we can compute the loss between these two points, uh, the point from the data and the point that the model generated. So if we treat this like this, if we were uh, starting to build this kind of autoencoder structure, which uh, will help us to, to solve this mode collapse problem. So just to reiterate the notation, uh, to, just to simplify the notation, uh, we'll write it down like this. So the probability of x given z, uh, we will uh, refer to as p. So that's sort of the probability distribution described by the top model, by the decoder model. And the red one, Q, is the probability distribution described by the uh, encoder model. And these are the two probability distributions that we can easily compute and sample from. Anything else we can't do because these are neural networks. So we can only feed Z to the neural network and get a dis distribution on X out of it, or feed X to the neural network and get a distribution of Z out of it. So now we need to take this, uh, this loss function the uh, sum over all the data of the logarithm of the probability of x, um, which is not a function we can compute, so we use this decomposition based on q, which we already saw, where q is an approximation to the actual conditional probability on z, given x. And then we get this, uh, the decomposition takes the kuhlbach leibler divergence between these two things, these two neural networks, and gives us this leftover term L, which we want to, uh, <coughs> which we can then use. Um, now in the expectation maximization algorithm, we could actually um, solve for both. So we solved for both alternately, right? We first minimized L and then we minimized, uh, or maximized L and then we minimized KL. Um, here we can't do this, because KL is completely, com completely impossible to compute for these neural networks. So we're going, we're going to forget about this KL, and we are just going to focus on what we call the variational lower bound, or the evidence lower bound, or elbow function, 
this part, this L. And that's going to become our loss function. Because if we just take this L, what we see here is that this L is a lower bound for the thing we actually want to maximize, right? So if we just get this lower bound as big as we can, then we're also pushing up the thing we actually want to maximize. So we're being a little bit less neat than the EM algorithm. Uh, we're not actually maximizing the uh, maximum likelihood. The, sorry, we're not actually maximizing the likelihood, but we're maximizing a lower bound on the likelihood. So we're still pushing up the likelihood as much as we can. Uh, and this, to remind you, this is the L function. And because we're doing deep learning, we want to minimize things. So we put a minus in front of it. So instead of maximizing L, we're minimizing minus L. And now what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite L into something we can stick into a deep learning system. So a couple of lines of math here. This is our L, which we get from this decomposition. Uh, we write, uh, we uh, break apart the um, top part of the fraction using the uh, definition of conditional probability, slide 22 in lecture probability one. So we break it apart like that. And then we take all of these things outside of the logarithm. All three, so the multiplications become sums and the fraction becomes a subtraction. And then we take it outside of the expectation as well, which hopefully by now we're a bit used to. So we get three, the sum of three expectations. And now we can gather these up together again uh, like this. So the second term and the third term together become the KL divergence, another KL divergence. But this time the KL divergence between QV and PW. And what's left over is the expected log likelihood of Q given Z, of X given Z, sorry. Um, so note that these are three functions now that correspond to things we know and we can compute because Q Z given X is basically our neural network from Z, from X to Z. That's our red neural network, our Q neural network. P from Z to X, that's our green neural network, our decoder. And P W Z, we know from the way we defined our neural network. So our neural network is a very complicated, dis complicated um, probability distribution. But if we marginalize out the x's, we get just the distribution on z, which we've chosen. Because way back when, when we defined our generator, we said it's going to be a neural network. And it works by choosing a z from a multivariate normal distribution, standard multivariate normal distribution feeding that to the neural network and getting an x out. So for this thing, which we've called p, the distribution on z is actually known. It's what we chose. It's the standard multivariate normal. So these three terms, if we ignore the expectations for now, are things we know and things we can work with. So this is now our loss function. This is the thing we want to minimize. Uh, yeah, well, that's what I just said. So this is what we want to minimize. So let's focus on the KL term first. This is basically telling us that if we feed something to the Q network and something pops out, we get a distribution out, right? That distribution should be as close as possible to the standard normal distribution. So what this KL term does, it pulls the Z vectors, the means of the Z vectors towards the origin and the um, sigmas of the z vectors it pulls towards this uh, hypersphere around the origin. Uh, and you can work this out analytically. I won't do it here. I think you're probably overloaded already. But you can actually, uh, this, uh, the difference between whatever the Q network outputs here, some mean and some sigma, and the mean zero and sigma one in every direction, you can work out analytically. And it, it works out into a function that is differentiable. So this is just a differentiable part of our loss function that we can work out. 
if you ever want to implement a variational out encoder, you have to look up what that is, but it's not that difficult. Um, so this term is fine. We can just implement this term. The other term is a little bit more tricky because it's an expectation. So what, what it uh, is asking for is the expectation. So um, sorry, our encoder has given us a distribution on Z, which is not the standard uh, normal distribution, but whatever came out of the encoder. And under that distribution, so if we sample a Z from this distribution, feed it to the green network, and we get an output on X, um, if we then compute the logarithm of P X given Z, we want to maximize that expectation. Minimize, sorry, minimize that expectation. So that's quite uh, difficult to do. And it's, uh, you can't work that out into an analytical function that is differentiable, so we have to approximate this. And the most straightforward way of approximating an expectation is just taking a bunch of samples and taking the average value. So we do that. We take L samples from this distribution here that uh, Q has provided us with. We, for each of them, we compute this logarithm of the P uh, probability density, and we take the average. Right, And that's a very straightforward uh, estimate of this expectation. And then to keep things simple, we set L to 1, so we don't actually take this sum. We just, for one sample, we just take this logarithm because we're going to train lots and lots of batches, right? We're going to do this whole autoencoder stuff lots and lots of times. Um, so on average, this will probably work out to the correct, uh, to the correct uh, expectation. So that gives us this for our loss function. The expectation has been replaced by just minus the log likelihood given uh, Z, uh, where, oh, given Z prime, where Z prime is a sample from this distribution. So now we almost have an autoencoder and a neural network that is fully end-to-end -end differentiable that we can just feed an X, pass it through all of this, get an X back, compute the loss, and backpropagate that loss. But it sort of gets stuck here in the middle because we have this sampling step. And that's not differentiable. We can't work out the gradient for the sampling step. So in order to fix that, and that's the last part of the VAE that we need to fix to make it work, we need to look back to this slide from the last lecture about sampling from multivariate normal distributions. So what I showed you there was that if you want to sample from a multivariate normal distribution, what you do is you take a sample from a standard MVM and you multiply it by your parameters. So you multiply it by A, where A is decomposition of your uh, sigma, and you add the mean. So it's actually sampling from a multivariate normal distribution is a very simple process if you already have a sample from a standard multivariate normal distribution. So we can actually work this computation into our neural network. So we give our neural network one extra input, which provides it with some randomness, namely uh, a sample from a standard multivariate normal distribution. We change the Q function to not give us the sigma, but give us the uh, A function, which we can just decide because it's learning it anyway. So we can just decide now that the output is actually the A function. And what we do is we multiply this noise by the A, at the mean, and that the result of that is our sample. So all we've done is implement this sampling step, sampling from a multivariate normal distribution, as part of our neural network. So that now we can backpropagate through it. That's called the reparametrization trick, uh, if you're interested. Oh, sorry. Um, so this. Uh, all together is the variational autoencoder. This, here we have our loss function worked out in something that's differentiable. And now we have an end-to-end -end encoder-decoder structure. Uh, 
which gives us, which is very complicated to work out, but practically it's relatively simple to implement. And it gives us a much more principled approach to training a generator than we got from either the GANs or the autoencoders. Because now we really know what we're fitting. It took a bit of working out, but now we know that this model is actually giving us a lower bound on the maximum likelihood fit uh, of the variational uh, of, of the data. So if you compare it to GANs, it's sort of the opposite of a GAN. A GAN goes from the latent space to the data space and back to something else. And a, a variational autoencoder or any autoencoder goes from the data space to the latent space and back to the data space. Uh, and you can do interpolation. And the nice thing about VAEs is that they don't just work for images, they work for lots of data. So here's a, a an image, uh, uh, sorry, a language example. So what we see here is um, something trained with a regular autoencoder to generate data, uh, to generate language, sorry. So trained on sentences, every instance is one sentence. We train the autoencoder and we end up with an interpolation. So now we can interpolate between elements of our data. We take two items of our data, we map it to the latent space, we draw this line in between it, and we decode this line. And what we see here is that it doesn't work. What we see is that all the points in between these two points from our data, in between the two bold sentences, are not all um, grammatical sentences. Because I store to buy some groceries is not a grammatical sentence. And if we do this with a variational autoencoder, um, because of this noise in the middle, because of the sampling step, if we encode one of these sentences and then feed it through the whole, if we feed one of these sentences through the whole variational autoencoder, it actually does the sampling step, so it moves, the late, it moves the item in the latent space a little bit. So it's not just forcing the decoder to work on the latent, uh, latent points of our data, but also the points nearby. So it's sort of forcing this interpolation to work much better. And what we get is actually grammatical sentences. We can actually interpolate between two latent space sentences, and everything in between is also a grammatical sentence. It's not smooth, but then the data is not smooth. There's no real way to do this uh, to do this smoothly and have everything in between be a grammatical sentence. Uh, so that's quite nice. It, it works for language as well and for discrete data as well. Um, yeah, I tried to do the smiling experiment for the same data as I showed you earlier, but that didn't, uh, didn't work in time, so I'll have to show you an existing uh, model from an existing paper. So here we have uh, the smile vector with a va variational autoencoder, and because this interpolation works much well, much better than a normal autoencoder, the smile experiment, smile vector experiment works much better as well. Uh, and I think they do some other stuff as well, right? They do uh, the sunglasses vector, which we got by accident earlier, uh, and the subtract sunglasses vector uh, as well. That's quite an interesting one, because you have to imagine what David Duchovny's eyes look like. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the nice things you can do with VAEs, which you can do with GANs, because a GAN doesn't give you this mapping into the latent space. Oh yeah, so do, to do a proper comparison, so if you, uh, both, of, both GANs and VAEs allow us to train this generator that maps random noise to our data space. Uh, the GANs work much better for images. Last year they said slightly better for images, I think now we can say GANs work much better. The distance has sort of grown a little bit. But VAEs work for many more domains. VAEs also work for language and they also work for music. Um, so they're a little bit broader. VAEs are derived from first principles, while GANs are a little bit more ad hoc. You can analyze GANs using game theory and you get very interesting results. But you don't have this approach from first principles. Um, And uh, finally, because of the way, uh, they're not aligned anymore, these points, but um, uh, 
So GANs can't handle a discrete data very easily. If you have language, for instance, that's very discrete. GANs can't handle that because um, it's uh, the, dis the data with a GAN, the data is in the middle of your network, right? So if there's discrete data in the middle of your network, you can back, back propagate through that. And VAEs can't easily handle discrete latent variables. So if you have a discrete latent distribution, like a categorical distribution, you can't handle that using VAE because that part is in the middle of your network. So that's difficult to backpropagate through. Um, and finally, another comparison that's probably useful to make. Uh, if you remember, in the second week, we talked about principal component analysis, which was a way to both do dimensionality reduction and whiten your data. So you reduce the dimensionality of the data and you map it to a standardized multivariate normal distribution. And that sounds a lot like what VAEs do, and in, in a way there's a, there's a lot of uh, correspondence between the two. So PCA is a linear transformation to this reduced, dimension, reduced standardized dimensional uh, representation, and VAEs are a nonlinear transformation. So it's much more powerful and it can do much more stuff but it also is then much more difficult to train, so you have to train it using gradient descent, whereas PCE, PCA, sorry, you can find an analytical solution, you can just solve the problem and you will get back a solution. Uh, and PCA also gives you meaningful dimensions, usually, depending on what your data is, but what we saw with, uh, if we do PCA on faces, we get uh, a smiling dimension. If you look at the principal component, it will uh, describe age, for instance, and if you look at the second principal component, it will describe gender, and if you look at the third, it will describe whether somebody's smiling. With the uh, VAE, we're not so lucky, so the dimensions themselves in the latent space don't, don't usually mean anything if you move along the dimension, and you have to do this trick of finding the smiling vector first. So the smiling vector is not aligned with one of the dimensions, it's just sort of a random dimension in space. Uh, but if you're willing to do that, then you can usually find much higher level semantic features. And that's all I had for you today. So next uh, lecture, I don't remember what we're going to talk about, so <laughs> we'll see you on Thursday.